15th meeting of the Social Justice and Social Security Committee. Our first item of business today is a decision to take item three in private. Are we all agreed? That's great. Thank you very much. And um, we now turn to our next item of business, which is an evidence session on our inquiry into low income and debt problems. We had our first formal evidence session on this inquiry on the 28th of April. Today we'll be hearing from two panels. The first will look at the delivery of money advice services and key issues for people on low incomes. The focus on the second panel is debt and mental health. I'll begin by welcoming our first panel. Online we are joined by Peter Kelly, who's the director of the Poverty Alliance, Sarah Jane Dunn, who's the policy manager for financial health at Citizens Advice Scotland, um, and Anna Baldock, who's the financial inclusion team leader, One Parent Families in Scotland. And um, we also have in the room with us, which is um, fantastic, the first time we've got somebody in, we have Emma Jackson, National Director um, for Scotland of Christians Against Poverty. So welcome this morning to all of um, our, our panel. Um, and we also have colleagues um, Pam Duncan Glancy and Foisal Chowdhury who are joining us remotely. Um, a few housekeeping points to mention before um, we kick off. For those of you that are online, please do type R in the chat function if you want to come in on a question. Um, and do allow a few seconds um, for broadcasting colleagues to turn your microphone on before you start speaking. Um, and Emma, um, if you can indicate just by kind of raising your hand um, that you want to come in, um, I'll make sure that I see that. And all of us in the room will endeavour not to direct every question at Emma as she's sitting here, so we will we'll be very mindful of that. And please, everybody, don't feel as if you need to answer every single question, because we've got a lot of questions to get through, and four people on the panel means that we're going to be a little bit tight for time. But if you do have something that you want to add, please do let us know and, and come in. Um, we have round about an hour um, this morning um, for this panel. Um, so I'm going to now turn to my colleagues um, who are going to ask questions in turn, um, and and we're going to start with my colleague Emma, Emma Roddick. Thank you. Thank you, convener, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I have my first question um, directing towards Sarah Jane, but I suspect a few others might have um, opinions. I think at the moment there's still a bit of a misunderstanding that you know um, learning to budget can fix everything for everyone. Um, but what I'm hearing is that for a lot of households, their income is just not as much as their outgoings every month and, and it's, it's that simple. Um, are you finding that there are more people coming to you for help who just have no possible way to make ends meet in their, their current work or with their current benefits? Uh, yes. Certainly a key issue for both low incomes and, and debt problems is the rising cost of living. And we are seeing that there are people coming to our bureaus with deficit budgets. And demand for advice from across our network is certainly showing that growing concern. Um, you know, in terms of our online advice pages, we're seeing concerns around landlords increasing rent. Uh, we're seeing um, online advice around food banks, almost double that of March 2021. And certainly preliminary data from our citizen advice bureaus is suggesting that demand around advice um, or debt advice is close to pre-pandemic levels. So we know that certain groups such as those on low incomes, uh, larger family households and people with vulnerabilities such as disabilities, including mental health, are more likely to be in poverty. And that certainly is the case when you see the cost of living will continue to make this worse because incomes are being stretched beyond any reasonable standard of living. But even before COVID and this cost of living crisis, families in poverty were having to prioritise what they were going to pay, with many having limited or no disposable income after essential bills. In fact, like you say, many don't have enough to pay their essential bills, which is pushing them further into poverty. And when it comes to dealing with debt, money advisors in our network are concerned because they, whilst they can deal with the client's debt of today, they know that unless the root causes of what's pushing their clients into poverty and debt, these clients will fall back into debt and return to advice three, six, nine months down the line. But when we think about options for those on low incomes, yes, they can be limited. But as a former money advisor, we kind of have a saying that like life, money advisors will always find a way to support clients. And even if that means looking at temporary solutions such as token payments or moratorium to help tide that client over until either the situation stabilises or we can improve it through income maximisation, or even just to give them time to consider what's the best option for now. 
Um, and that does have a knock-on effect because obviously that involves intense hand-holding and support, which adds another level of complexity to clients' cases, which means that advisors are having clients on their books for longer and needing more in-depth support, especially for those on no, the no disposable income and having to try to deal with those rising debts. So at the moment, money advisors do have that feeling that they are firefighting and looking ahead, knowing that the worst is yet to come, because that's one of the fa facts that we need. Whilst we are in the cost of living crisis, we are also in the summer months. So people who are prioritising bills and having to decide whether they put their heating on or put food on the table, they can be a little bit economical with um, their electricity usage or maybe being able to turn off the heating. But when we get to those cold and darker months, when things start to really feel that pinch, that's when people are going to start to really have to think about what do we have to do? Because at some times, for clients in our network, they don't actually have even a choice of eat, heating or eating. But like I do say, we do have a range of tools which our money advisors are trying to use to limit that damage. And we'll always try to find a way to support clients as best as possible. But we can do more to support money advisors to tackle those issues. Thanks very much for that. that. Emma Jackson in the room would like to come in, Emma. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I guess really just to build on what Sarah Jane is um, saying there, that, that we are um, experiencing people coming to us at the point of needing debt help, describing an incredibly difficult set of circumstances. We know that, unfortunately, people do continue to wait until things reach the point of crisis before reaching out for help, because there still, sadly, exists so much stigma and shame around debt uh, and seeking help. But the, the types of issues that, that our clients are reporting to us um, are around food scarcity, um, a third of our clients at CAP would say that they regularly miss meals because um, they don't have enough income. Um, a quarter are reporting at the moment that they're skipping kind of putting heating on. Um, and like Sarah Jane said, this is in the milder months, so it, it kind of really is those concerns. So we know that people are people are trying to minimise the, the impact themselves. They're trying to take every measure um, not to get into debt and not to fall further in, into debt. Um, but sadly, about 65% of our clients would say that they've had to borrow um, from family or friends um, to afford food or fuel, um, really basic, essential, everyday items that, that we know that everybody needs. Um, and like CAS and like other organisations, we work with people to enable them to go debt free uh, and to try to find a solution to the immediate issue that, that they have. And we have good statutory debt solutions for people. Often it's an, an insolvency option. Um, but the reality that we're facing for, for in households on the lowest incomes um, is what we would describe as deficit budgets. So once we have worked with that individual to clear their debts, um, we would provide them with what we describe as a debt-free budget to help people to continue to manage their income and stay debt-free. Um, and, and these are looking impossible, uh, really very difficult for people. Um, I wanted to bring an example to the committee of that this morning of a single adult household um, in Ayrshire that we're working with. We're very nearly at the point um, of insolvency of a map um, for that individual. Um, their sole income is through social security. Um, they have anxiety, depression, often prone to panic attacks. Um, and as we're building the budget for this individual, once they go debt free, they have £8.55 per week for food and all household items. £8.55, you know, that, that's actually £1.22 a day. Uh, I don't know about you, but I would find that almost impossible to, to stretch, to cover food, toiletries, you know, washing up liquid, all of the things that we kind of need. So whilst we can take that individual to the point of being debt free, £8.55 is not sustainable. Um, and the very tragic reality is that that individual will fall back again into problem debt. Thank you, Emma, for, for that um, example there. I think that's really important for the committee to hear that. Um, um, I do know that, that Peter um, and Anne on, online would like to come in on that, if we can have them come in briefly, please. And then, Emma, do you have a follow-up question? Yep. So, Peter first, please. Thank you, Convener. Um, and just very briefly to follow up, because I think Emma has made the point, and Jane as well, very powerfully. Um, I, th I think the, 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 the issue of budgeting um, is, is really crucial. You know, it's about what do we... What do we expect? What is people's individual responsibility to try and work their way out of these um, problems that they find themselves in? And I think, as Emma has just said, the scope for doing that is incredibly limited. Um, 
and impossible. Uh, the, the message we get from our members is that budgets are, are stretched beyond breaking now for, for individuals. So I think we need to be mindful when we're discussing in this inquiry today and, and through the rest of your, your work, um, the importance of low income and the importance of um, not only income maximisation, but looking at, at how we secure adequate incomes for, for individuals. Um, the other brief point I wanted to make as well is the, the context that we're in just now. We're all very focused on the cost of living crisis, and that's absolutely right, and it is something that we need to be really concerned about. But I think this, we, we remember this cost of living crisis comes on top of uh, budgets already being stretched for those on low incomes during the pandemic. Uh, on the back of, uh, we remember that the, the the start of the pandemic was only when uh, benefit levels were unfrozen. Um, so I think we need to remember that context that we go into this inquiry and uh, where where people are already facing it really significant challenges. Um, so we need to bear that in mind when we're looking at the kind of solutions that we can come up with. Thanks, Peter. And if we can hear from Anne. Hello. Um, <clears throat> what we've been finding at One Parent Families is that more and more the the parents that we're dealing with um, aren't just parents that are on benefits, but also on low income. Uh, lone parents, in particular, tend to have quite a, an up and down employment history, um, and this can cause significant problems. Um, lone parents can often feel quite isolated uh, and maybe don't have a lot of family and friends support. The type of service that we deliver is very much uh, a holistic way of looking at things and not just looking at debt as something in isolation. Um, we have different sections in our organisation that can help people with family support and employability. So it's very much uh, taken the the issue as a as an overall problem. Um, however, as the rest of my you know colleagues have said, um, more and more it's becoming too difficult to actually do that because you can help somebody budget, you can maximise their income as much as possible, but the reality is that the amount of money just is not there to provide uh, the support that is needed ongoing. Uh, over the last two years during the pandemic, um, we were able to hand out significant amounts of crisis payments, but most of these crisis payments have now finished, and charities are struggling to provide grants uh, to get somebody over an initial crisis to be then able to look at their debt. Um, so, it, especially with young parents who are um, affected by the young parent penalty, where if they're under 25, they receive less universal credit than parents over 25. Emma, back to yourself. Yeah, thank you all so much for for those answers. Um, I did want to follow up on disabled people specifically because I know that the the rising costs, the things that are getting more expensive, include stuff like energy bills, which we know are going to impact disabled people more. But picking up on on Sarah Jane's comment around you know the warmer months, um, that's obviously not going to be as helpful to to people in certain island and, and coastal communities. Are you finding that there is that disparity in in location as well as as other characteristics. Sarah Jane. Yes, um, certainly the rural element of, like you were saying, in, in highlands and islands, there is that disparity, especially when you think about energy costs. A lot of people in those areas are on non regulated uh, energy, so um, oil, um, uh, colour gas, for example. And the problem with that is, though, 
The support that usually comes out is usually geared towards gas and electricity, so regulated energy. So there's usually less support for people. Um, and also they have to pay up front, which can be a significant cost that they have to find. And it can push their um, bills elsewhere in Syria. So they might have to think, well, I have to prioritise my oil bill because I, I need to buy that now. I, I, so, I won't, so I won't pay my rent or my mortgage uh, or I won't pay my council tax because I have to think about which bill is coming up. Um, in Money Advice, again, I, I'm going to probably do this a lot today, is we have a saying where you rob Peter to pay Paul. And a lot of the time that's what is happening is people are having to think about what bills do I prioritise? And when you come in, location is a definite, a significant issue, especially because if you are having to pay higher travel costs, um, food costs are usually higher. Um, a few years ago in our Dumfries and Galloway, um, bureaus did a study around the cost of living in a rural area and found that the price of a shopping basket was significantly higher in these areas than it was in urban. And all of that adds again to an already growing rising cost of living crisis, where they're having to try and think of what bill do I pay? Do I pay my rent? Do I pay my council tax? Do I put food on the table? And that's where people are having to try and think about what's a priority to them, but what do they need to have now? And it's, it's a struggle definitely on a daily basis. And like you were saying about disabled um, people, they, they're, we, you know, we've got cases and cases of clients who are coming in who are maybe on limited incomes, fixed incomes like pensions, or they might be on um, benefit-only income, and they're seeing a significant amount of that being eaten up because they have to have their heating on, for example, or they have to follow a special diet. I mean, when I was working on the front lines as a money advisor, I had a client who, because they were on a prepayment meter and their electricity switched off, they were very panicked because they have to keep their insulin in their fridge, and they need that insulin in order to be able to take a meal. And they, they, that panic of being able to not have that resource um, and to be able to keep their electricity on was more significant because of their disability. And that's another factor and another complexity that our advisors are having to see across the network. Thanks very much for that, Sarah Jane. Um, I'll move on to questions now from Miles Briggs um, to be followed by Pam Duncan Glance. Uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning to the panel. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I wanted to carry on the line of question with regards to access to services. Um, so, to kick off on that, I wanted to ask how the delivery of your services um, have changed um, compared to the start of the pandemic and now, and also whether or not you were able to carry on with face to face. Um, meetings with clients as well. So I'll maybe start again with Sarah Jane and then if anyone else wants to come in. Well, the Scottish Citizens Advice Network um, basically rallied to ensure that we're continuing to serve the public during the pandemic. And that was involved a very quick transition to remote working, meaning that we were still able to help people across the network, even during the pandemic. The advice bureaus were able to unlock over £147 million for people. And that meant that for every pound invested in core advice services, £14 was roughly um, returned into the communities. And Citizens of Scotland, our main role was to support our bureaus with that, to ensure that there was no disruption to services to seek. And that was providing bureaus with things like additional laptops and equipment, training advisors, and just supporting our bureau staff to make sure that they were OK and they were supported during that time. I, in fact, quite frankly, when I look back, I know that since the advice we were created uh, for the war effort, so we have it in our blood, if you will, but it was still astonishing to see the amount of work that our staff and volunteers across the network banded together. Some bureaus were able to offer face-to-face -face contact to the most vulnerable during COVID, and obviously that meant having to source things like PPE to make sure their health was protected, and that was increased uh, as restrictions were eased. Uh, we also launched our money map and our Sits of Scotland helpline during the pandemic to provide multi-channel support and making sure things like our advice pages, our digital advice team, for example, worked tirelessly to ensure that advice online remained accurate and up to date. Um, and we saw over two and a half million users during the pandemic using our online advice sites. Um, but during that time, we were also hearing from advisors who were constantly worried about what we call our frequent flyers. So this is people we know who are clients who rely on face-to-face, -face, either out of necessity or choice, such as those who are digitally excluded, for example, or just prefer the comfort of speaking to someone face-to-face, -face, which is certainly the case when it comes to debt advice. 
Um, when we think about remote delivery, yes, it can you know do wonders and has a lot of advantages and disadvantages. But if clients aren't able to access the bureau in a way that they want to, then that means that even the things that we were offering, like video chat, it just knows that advisors are worried about those clients who are needing our help but couldn't access the bureau at that time. Um, but when we think about it. it about our multi-channel support now, we're obviously going to continue delivering remote advice as much as possible, but using that to strengthen our face-to-face -face support now that we're able to do it. Hear from Emma from Christians Against Poverty as well. On that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, um, like the, the bureaus, we provide a network of 27 debt centres um, across Scotland. Uh, we're quite unique in our model of debt help. Our, our normal mode of delivery is to provide debt advice within the privacy and safety and comfort of individuals' homes. So our debt coaches go, go into to homes and, and deliver the appointments there. So, uh, yeah, like everyone, we had to completely pivot um, back in March 2020 and, and, and change our services. And during those um, very strict lockdown months, we were able to take our services to either a telephone or web-based service. Um, given that many of our clients experienced digital exclusion, it was predominantly telephone-based um, that we offered. But because um, we offer predominantly community-based support, we were able to keep going with some of what we would describe as doorstep support for our clients. We offer emergency aid. So at the first interaction that we have with someone, if there is no food in the fridge, um, the electricity has run out, there's, there's no mobile phone kind of top up. Um, um, we were still able to assess those needs and go out to people's homes and safely deliver that, that emergency port support for people and then predominantly journey through, through debt with them via sort of telephone-based based mechanisms. But then as, as restrictions eased uh, and we were able to provide face-to-face -face services for the most vulnerable, then we kind of pivoted and prioritised that, then moving through to, to being back where we are now um, in offering our home-based appointments. We, we've retained the option of choice. Um, that's actually been a, been a good thing for us to now build into the model the opportunity for phone-based services for some people who prefer that, but that we find predominantly with the client base that we have, it, it is face-to-face -face, um, in-home uh, support that, that people want. And that provides opportunity not just for the specialist debt advice that people need, but that practical support, you know, the, the compassion, being able to, to draw alongside somebody and, and really see the extent of the difficulties that, that people are, are facing within, within their local communities. Um, so, as I say, we, we now kind of have that slightly sort of mixed model um, of how we deliver our service. Uh, and ultimately, we believe in channel choice. Um, it's, it's about the right people getting the right support for them. Not everybody would need in-person, in-home debt advice, um, but people should be able to choose and, and access the port that's right for them. Thanks for that. Miles, do you have any? Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, you touched upon this in your response, Emma, because I wanted to ask, um, in terms of what you've learnt during uh, the pandemic, and um, specifically around new models. I know when I visited um, the Citizens Advice Bureau down in Leith that we were talking about how there's partnerships being developed um, with some of the banks to actually look towards that early intervention to help support people. So I just wondered what learning um, had happened, which you've carried on. You said it's different sort of access to, to support, like a phone line service. But is there anything else we maybe need to know about around specifically early intervention schemes? I think, like everybody, the, the pandemic really provided an opportunity for collaboration, quick, meaningful collaboration, video calls and kind of coming together um, so that we could look at addressing what, what the issues were. You know, as, as an organisation, we already had good existing um, partnership relationships with, with organisations like, like CAS, like, like the Poverty Alliance, but the, the pandemic almost acted like a catalyst to kind of super speed some of that. And we were able to build new relationships with, with, with other organisations like, like Shell. For, for example, so that we can really do that like earliest point of, of referral. Um, people still don't know out there that free professional debt advice exists. I've already mentioned about the stigma and shame. Um, people carry within them these, these myths that, that my problem's the worst that exists out there. Nobody's seen anything like this. There's no help. There's no possible way out of, of my circumstances. Um, and it's incredibly important that, you know, across both civil society, across the third sector, across the NHS, that, that everybody is aware um, that there are, that help does exist, that you can get 
free professional debt help. And um, we really believe in the concept of no wrong door. Um, so whether I spoke to my GP about my debt help or, or my health visitor or, or my son's primary school teacher, that person would be able to say there is free debt help available for you to Scotland and point you in the right direction. So strengthening of the, of the partnership relationships, Miles, has, has been really important. Another thing that we have had to, as, as a response of the pandemic, is, is increase our, our emergency support that, I, that I've described to you. Um, the extent of the issues that people are facing, the complexity of cases, mean that people really are in the most difficult of, of circumstances. Um, so we have seen an increase in people needing that. So we have chosen as a charity to, to widen and extend our budget so that we are able to meet those crisis needs as people contact us. Thanks for that. I do have um, Sarah Jane and Anne looking to come in, if they can come in very briefly on this, because we're 25 minutes in and two, two, two um, members into question. So please briefly, Sarah Jane and then Anne. Yeah, I was just going to really echo what Emma was saying there in regards to ourselves and our own sets of advice network. We're also a community-based organisation like Christians Against Poverty. We work very closely with Christians Against Poverty and a lot of our bureaus across Scotland have very solid connections with their local communities. But what is important to note is different services offer different support at different levels and collaboration, collaboration is certainly key. But one of the things that we think for this model to thrive is training is definitely needed for certain um, partners. Uh, one example I can best give is mental health settings. So we are obviously trying to work within the Citizen Advice Bureau to work closer with our uh, mental health practitioners and uh, support workers and local community mental health teams. And um, whilst our advisors are being trained on the understanding of mental health and how that interacts with money, the same cannot be said about mental health professionals' understanding of the debt and advice service processes. And that's not about making them become a money advice expert or even asking these professionals to provide debt advice, but by giving them a basic knowledge of the debt advice journey and certain key features, such as what the debt and mental health evidence form is, what severe mental impairment can mean for their service users, really means that then they feel confident enough to bring in these questions when looking at a client's mental health crisis, for example, and whether financial issues are um, causing it or being caused by it. And if we really want to start to break this vicious cycle of debt and poverty, we really need to look at bringing up the base knowledge of our trusted partners, if you will, and other um, organisations and services that we want to work with uh, so that they understand how debt advice and debt interacts with somebody's mental health issues, for example, um, and going beyond just placing money advisors in settings such as GP surgeries. This is about bringing up their knowledge base and their understanding so that they feel confident enough to discuss it with their service users. Thanks, Sarah Jane. And if we can hear really briefly from Anne on this point. Nick, we, um, we moved to a different way of working. Um, we couldn't do face to face for quite a while. Um, but after that, we used the family support workers and the family support working network that we have in OPFS. Um, and we relied on them to actually get information that maybe we couldn't get over the, the phone or over Zoom meetings. Um, and they were very good at keeping in touch with parents ongoing um, so that if they were stressed out or were suffering from anxiety um, because of their debts, they had somebody there that acted as a link. Um, likewise, our advice helpline. Um, we saw a huge increase in the inquiries that we had during the pandemic um, because a lot of the, the debt letters and the debt companies started using much more um, text services and emails. So clients were getting repeated text messages. Um, so now that we've moved back into a, a hybrid system where we offer whatever the client needs, um, we've learned from what we used during the pandemic uh, to provide a service that is suited much more to what an individual person needs and the support that they need to deal with their debt. 
Thanks for, th for that, Anne. And it was really important to hear that, that message regarding people getting multiple texts and multiple emails from, from um, you know, their creditors, which um, really did impact on a lot of, of people's mental health. You know, when your phone's buzzing and you don't know if you want to look at it, it's the same as when the envelopes land on the, the mat, but it's just continuous and sometimes even through the night. So thanks for bringing that up. Um, I'm going to bring Pam Duncan Glancy in, who's online for her questions, to be followed by Paul McLennan. Pam, please. Hi, good morning, uh, convener, uh, and good morning to the panel. Um, I'm sorry I'm not there in person today, um, and thank you for all the submissions uh, sent in so far to the inquiry. They've been incredibly helpful, and for the evidence that you've given this morning, some of which is incredibly hard to hear, um, and I can't imagine how hard it is to have to um, deliver the services that you're working in, so a, a massive thank you for that. Um, I have a couple of questions um, for uh, Sarah Jane, if that's okay, and then a couple for, for Peter. Um, so, first of all, um, to, to Sarah Jane, um, we heard last week of a really horrific operating environment, to be honest, of some of the Citizens Advice um, Bureau's advisors and what, what they're having to deal with because of a lot of what you've explained um, this morning. And, and just that they're, they're completely burnt out. And in fact, someone said that they too, that their, their staff are worrying about some of the same issues. Um, that the people they're giving advice to are worrying about, which of course um, really shows the, the depth um, and the change in nature um, of poverty and debt in Scotland. So, what is your understanding of that environment right now? Can you tell us a little bit more about about the, the experience of your advisors? Um, and then um, a slightly different question, um, but also for Sally Ann. So, just to, um, for the interest of time to move it on. We, we know that digital exclusion prevents people from accessing some services, and we heard the evidence in, in the previous session that mobile phone companies let people access the NHS without using their data during the pandemic. Um, would this help um, for the clients that you are working with um, if they were able to access some specific websites without using mobile phone data um, allowance, and if so, which, which ones? Thanks. Thanks for that, Pam. Um, over to yourself, Sarah Jane. Okay, um, certainly the experience of our advisors, uh, as you say, there are a lot of our advisors, and certainly being a past advisor myself, I was given advice up until um, September 2020. So I know that it can be very hard when you are hearing these harrowing stories to switch off at night. Uh, really you've have, you have clients coming to you who are at the brink of crisis and who have contemplated suicide, some have attempted suicide. Uh, and it can be very difficult when you're looking at their situation that it can feel that sense of hopelessness. However, a money advisor will try to do what they can to support that client as best as they can in that situation. And when there's a level of complexity, so the clients that we're seeing coming to our bureaus, for example, um, they're not just coming with a debt advice issue. They are coming with housing issues, employment issues, immigration issues. They are multi-layered and complex, and, and a money advisor has to look at what support they can give and what support other services are out there to support with and able to almost provide a multidisciplinary approach to a client's situation to see whether if there's something that we can do um, to deal with that root cause so that when they are debt-free, like Emma was saying, they are able to then move on. Now, some clients, you're only maybe able to, be able to provide temporary relief, and it's something that we have to constantly look at and deal with. And, you know, I've had clients in my 12 years of money advice um, who basically were there throughout my 12 years of career, and I had to go back to them time and time again because... Things like chronic lack of income, no matter how much budgeting and income maximisation, is never going to deal with an, a lack of income and never going to solve that problem. We have to look at, obviously, other routes and solutions that might be able to deal with it. Things like fuel poverty, looking at energy efficiency measures, for example. So it can lead to advisor burnout and, and advisor well-being being affected, especially because it can feel sometimes that no matter what you're doing, your client's coming back to that and, and for further advice. Um, but we do have advisors who have been in the business 25, 30 years. So it can be very individual. Uh, the best thing I can always say is, is making sure that our advisors are supported and they've got a range of tools in their arsenal that will help a range of different clients and as best as possible, because in that way, they won't feel like they're not being able to do anything and that they have found a way to support that client. 
In regards to digital exclusion, and um, you're right, certainly um, there would be a pocket of clients where access to data, um, to certain websites without having to use their data up would be a massive use because data poverty is a significant issue. But when we think of digital exclusion, it's not just a lack of being able to afford data or being able to um, get access to data. In actual fact, some of it can be a lack of confidence um, or a lack of digital skills. So even if they did have access to that NHS website, would they actually be able to navigate it in order to find what they wanted to use as well? So when we think of digital exclusion, we have to think of the different uh, clients that come under that bracket. And a lot of the times, many people don't want to use digital. They want to go face to face with somebody. Um, Money Advice Scotland did uh, research years ago on the client journey. And certainly when it came to things like finding out initially where to go for debt advice and to get that initial set up, digital and remote um, advice was what they wanted. But when they were actually wanting to look over their options and discuss what they wanted to do, it was face to face. So when we think of digital exclusion, we also have to think of client choice and, cl and make sure it's not a channel shift instead and make sure it's a channel, a channel choice. Thank you for that, Sarah Jane. And Pam, you've got questions for Peter. I do. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that, Sarah Jane. Um, much appreciated. Um, and convener, for uh, for the interest of time, I might roll one of my questions, which might sit more um, appropriately in theme two um, into this one, um, with your permission, if that's okay. Yep. Go ahead, as long as it's quite quick. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Um, so my question um, is for Peter, um, if that's okay, or my few questions. Um, the, we, we know in some of the evidence that about sixty thousand people got into debt for the first time during the pandemic. So I was wondering, what do you think this tells us about the picture of poverty in Scotland? What does that mean for how services are delivered and what the solutions are? And then we we also know from your submission that you've called for a more joined up data sharing scheme for support services and for affordable credit. Could you explain a little bit about what happens now and what that more joined up scheme would, would look like? And then um, finally, um, we, we know that People don't have enough to pay for essentials, and even bankruptcy, um, as, as has been already said, is a temporary solution. What specific action could we take in Scotland to to do about that um, and address the cost of living crisis uh, today? Thanks. Over to yourself, Peter. Thanks, Pam. Um, I might have to come back to you to just uh, repeat the, the final of the three questions there. Um, I think, as I, as I guess I kind of alluded to the, in the opening statement, the pandemic has changed things and it has um, changed the, the pattern of poverty or, or certainly um, deepened or hastened some of the, the existing patterns of poverty. So in terms of um, in work poverty, uh, the, uh, also around the out of work poverty and the value of social security benefits. So we've seen that change. Um, I think it's also highlighted to us the importance of precarity in terms of labour market experience, but also in relation to uh, issues around housing and uh, access to housing and affordable housing. So it's it's kind of, I guess the pandemic has has um has heightened our awareness of, of many issues that were already existing in terms of the way that, that poverty plays out in Scotland and across the UK. And debt is one of those those crucial dimensions of that picture of poverty. I think, as you said, you know, um, 60,000 uh, people um, uh, increasing their debt during the pandemic. Um, and as I said earlier, you know, more people um, more people reporting that they just simply can't stretch budgets any further. So the opportunities to um, to manage uh, on low incomes have become increasingly difficult. And the cost of living crisis, the inflation, and the the changes in the energy cap um, have all magnified these problems. So things are getting, I guess, the, the general. Um, response, Pam, is that things are getting much tougher, and we're seeing that reflected in the kinds of issues that um, colleagues are speaking about today, but also that are reflected through uh, the membership of the Poverty Alliance. We're just seeing that 
um, uh, intensification of already existing problems and more people being drawn in uh, to those issues. Um, your second question was, I think, around um, data sharing and, and, and joined up approaches. And I guess, again, this, this is about um, uh, that no wrong door approach that, that one of my colleagues mentioned earlier as well. Um, I think there is, um, if, if we take access to um, social security benefits and the automation of um, uh, uh, passported benefits, I think that 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 we need to consider that people um, who are clearly on low incomes and are known to be on low incomes by um, some public authority, um, being able to enable those people to have automatic access to other entitlements is really important. I think the, the, the ways in which we can help notify organisations and that organisations, uh, third sector, community-based organisations are able to uh, access data and share data. That's that's something that's quite complex and obviously has uh, legal implications in terms of the way that data is shared. But I think public authority would be better able um, to communicate and share uh, information is absolutely crucial. It doesn't seem to be happening at the moment. There there does seem to be um, good moves afoot, certainly in Glasgow, where there is um, there has been, as far as I understand, some some greater efforts to. Um, to share data, I know that um, the the relationship with DWP in terms of the data that they hold on low income is really crucial. And I think there needs to be more done to ensure that that, that data is shared effectively. And um, the third part of your question has now completely gone for me. So if you could maybe uh, repeat that, I didn't quite capture. It. Thanks, Peter. Um, and thanks for your answer. It was just basically what could we do in Scotland with the powers we have today to make this better? In terms of um, boosting income, so, the, so there was one part, let's um, try and focus, that there is lots that can be done. And, you know, we've spoken to the committee and we've committed evidence previously around a range of areas where we could uh, look to, to boost incomes. And again, I guess it's important to repeat that that um, boosting incomes through things like Scotch child payment, um, the mitigation of the um, benefit cap, those are very welcome efforts that have been uh, committed to by the Scottish Government. Um, one one area where I think we could possibly see um, more action um, is around access to affordable credit. This is something that was. Um, highlighted in the first child poverty delivery plan that the Scottish Government produced um, back in 2018. Um, I think in terms of the, the current focus um, around uh, preventative approaches, and that means uh, the kind of services that the colleagues here are providing directly, um, there was less of a focus in the new uh, child poverty delivery plan. It would have been good to see uh, more emphasis on that and to see clearer um, uh, clearer approaches around uh, developing the, um, the support for affordable credit, investment in affordable credit in Scotland. I think that is something that has been, that can be shown to, to make a difference, to, to help people keep out of uh, the most unaffordable um, and most uh, problematic forms of, of debt. So we need to see great investment in that. Um, scaling up um, some, some of the efforts, the, the welfare advice and health partnerships that are referred to in the Child Poverty Delivery Plan, they, those are um, really important measures, getting um, money advice into the 150 GPs um, in the most deprived communities in Scotland. That's really important. I think we can see that kind of model as um, something that will really help to ensure that people can access the support that they need and know about the support uh, that's available for them. Many thanks for that, Peter. We'll now turn to questions from Paul McClellan to be followed by Deputy Convener Natalie Don. 
Paul, please. Thank you, Convener. And thanks, panel, and thanks for your submissions and evidence so far this morning. I'll, I'll conscious of time, so I'll try and roll two questions into, into one. What, the first question was really just asking about the funding environment for your own organisation at the moment. I suppose where are you at the moment, and where are you kind of forecasting where the requirement would be for the next number of years? Uh, and the second part of the question was really just talking in about partnership working. Where do you see the role of partnership working, and particularly looking at specialised services? The evidence we kind of got last week was talking in about obviously looking at more fuel poverty issues. Um, and so it's, it's maybe touching on that issue, but also you know, where do you see the partnership working, um, I suppose, in, improving in the next number, of, next number of months and years? And I'll probably open it up to, probably to yourself, Emma, first of all, and then open it up to the panel after that. Thank you, Paul. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll pick up there on the on the partnership working. I've spoken a bit about that al already, so I won't repeat the things that I've said. And um, this kind of real idea of this this no wrong door, I think, is is, is really important, um, so that individuals can can get referred on. Um, but we need to, as we consider things like that, always be having in the fore of our mind the, the dignity and the agency of people who are experiencing problem debt. Um, and we must never get to a situation where someone is accessing one service and accessing that becomes about the conditionality of staying there unless you go on to get debt help. So you can't stay with us unless you go on. Um, so we've got to be careful about conditionality and, and kind of coercion. Um, one of the things that we know, as I've mentioned, is people do find it very difficult to take those first steps to begin to gather the evidence, understand the extent of the debt and, and kind of work out that solution. And there is an element of people needing to be ready and able to do that and be kind of supported within those journeys. But we've already got a number of really good joined up um, partnership arrangements and, and, and I think we can be building on those. And as Sarah Jane explained, just getting some entry level uh, information about the, the routes out of debt that exist across Scotland and, and where free debt help um, is available um, so that signposting and pointing can happen no matter um, where anybody anybody goes. Um, in terms of your questions then really uh, about about the funding environment for, for debt help organisations really across Scotland, um, I think the, the security of longer term funding um, would be deeply welcomed ac across the sector, the kind of precarious nature of, of, of one year bits of grant funding. Um, are just difficult and there's a there's a challenge that comes with service delivery in the mix of that so multi-year cycle funding um, would be incredibly welcomed across the service um, and again just that continued opportunity really for collaboration each of us who, who have organizations we deliver something unique and something different we're never in competition with one another but how do we come together um, to be able to kind of raise raise awareness um, a number of us participated in the Scottish government's um, debt awareness campaign that took place at, at the start of the year and that was a really excellent example um, of how organisations can work together, each highlighting their unique strengths so that individuals can, can make the right choice. Who would like to come in over to yourself, Sarah? Jane? Again, just to um, echo a couple of uh, Emma's points there, I certainly agreed with Emma in regards to a more sufficient and stable funding relationship, especially with local authorities. Um, and that just means that every person in Scotland has equal access to free, independent and confidential advice, which obviously our network is known and valued for. Um, in regards to uh, the, the, the relationship, I kind of want to yeah, go back to training, um, certainly in regards to understanding financial difficulties. Uh, for one example, I know you are probably going to be picking this up in the later panel, so I don't want to dwell on it for too long, is around things like the Debt Mental Health Evidence Form. So our advisors have to spend time and resources, time and resources that are very limited and very precious to them, especially at the moment, to explain what the Debt Mental Health Evidence Form is to mental health professionals so that they can get it completed. So they then have to go off to creditors and then do the same thing again, explain what the Debt Mental Health Evidence Form is and what it does. So by equipping these professionals with that knowledge and again of the money advice process not only encourages discussion but it just means that um, our service users are going to be looking at their, their multi-layered issues um, and there is good work being done and uh, elsewhere for example in Wales they use the money and pension service money guiders program which to in order to train mental health professionals for example uh, understanding what is involved in the money advice process um, the Money and Mental Health Policy Institute, who I know you're going to 
be listening to uh, later, are looking to develop an uh, e-learning module that is tied to continuous professional development around, again, teaching how mental health and money interacts and how someone's mental ill health can be impacted by money. And that's something that we could look like to adopt and explore in Scotland as well, so that if we are going to be making these partnerships and we are going to be having this level of collaboration, that both sides of the coin understand how it's connected. Thanks, Sarah Jane. I think that was really helpful for us to hear and will help us in, in the next panel as well to with our questions. Um, Paul, do you have anything else? I, I suppose just kind of touching on that, the supplementary, I, I suppose talking about, I think the three-year funding uh, model would be good. I, I think it's in terms of where are you kind of forecasting that in the next two or three years, for example? Do you see a massive increase in the funding that you'll require? And, and if so, obviously there will probably be a bit of... Um, time we required for training people up as well. So I'm, I'm just wondering, is, is that an issue? Is that something you're looking forward to, probably to both of you again, in terms of do you see a massive increase in funding that you require to run the services to meet the demand? And if so, you know, how do we then take on the training issues to train people up at that particular time? If we can hear very briefly from, yeah. from Sarah Jane on that, and then I do have Anne that wants to come in on it, and I will have to move on to the next question. Thanks. Yeah, so... Over the last couple of years, we were successful in securing funding for additional frontline money advisors, um, and that was from the debt -led advice levy, which uh, was also increased. Um, and that was mainly due to obviously to deal with the demand from the pandemic. Uh, we are currently in discussions with Scottish Government around support for money advice this year. And whilst there's not any additional funding coming from the UK government to help with demand for the cost of living, as it as it was for the pandemic. And that will limit our ability to increase capacity and help the greater numbers that are coming to CAB as service for support and advice. Thanks for that, Sarah Jane. And Anne, briefly. Mm -hmm. um, the, the funding question is, is all, has always been a problem within money advice um, in comparison to, say, welfare rights provision. Um, during the pandemic and beforehand, a lot of smaller organisations and charities like ourselves um, have formed very good local uh, connections with other organisations. Uh, we secured money through SLAB to do a Test for Change programme, which we are currently operating. And the focus on it is to try and reduce the the debt journey for people, and it's very much working with advisors who already know their clients well and can support them to get the information before they actually see a money advisor, which cuts things down. And I think looking at different programmes like that will broaden the the service that's available. There aren't a huge amount of money advisors available. Um, I always joke saying that we're a dying breed, um, but there needs to be investment into training new advisors and making working in money advice an attractive uh, prospect. So, really looking at how funding can be put in place that is over a set period so that people have job security and money advice, I think would go a long way to, to broaden the advice that is available. Thanks for that, Anne. Um, and I will move on to questions from Natalie Don. Thank you, convener, and thank you to the panel um, for appearing this morning and for your responses so far. Um, can I start off? Do the, do the members of the panel feel that there are any improvements which could be made to the processes and the procedures that are used by creditors which would help people with low incomes and debt problems? And um, Could I go to Peter first, please? Thank you. Um, I think... Um, improvements in process. One of the one of the areas that we haven't um, discussed so far is um, um, public debt, state debt. The fact that this is a, a growing dimension um, of the the debt problems that, that people face now, and I think it, it gives us a, an area for action where there's the scope given the, the the ties between regulators and the state for for much clearer. Um, 
and much better approaches. So, for instance, the the approach that we use around council tax debt, which is a is a an important part of the overall um, problem of over indebtedness, um, is very rapid and um, and perhaps we, is an area where we need to to see further action where we can look at building in um, uh, more steps that, that would allow people to address debt before that debt is actually increased. So, um, the issue of, of summary warrants and so on that actually increase the, the problem. So, I think um, that would that would absolutely be an area for debt uh, for for action. I think looking at other uh, aspects of of public debt as well. Um, where, where local authorities may and Scottish government may have um, have scope to to act around uh, things like Aberlour have highlighted the issue of um, school meals debt, um, which they estimate to be over a million pounds in Scotland at the moment. And there are there are actions that could be taken to ensure that either that debt is written off, particularly as um, primary school children move into secondary school, it's still the families are still um, carrying debt. So there. There are specific areas, I think, given the, the context overall that we're operating in uh, at the moment, where we could take some specific actions. Those are those are just two in the interest of time. Thanks, Peter. I think Sarah Jane wants to come in on this as well. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, in the interest of time, I won't go into the full answer that I would love to give. Um, we've, we've put this into our submission anyway to the committee. So um, around what, just uh, as Peter was saying, around what we could, would like councils to do, especially in relation to council tax arrears. Um, but one suggestion, which I know was raised um, by Alan McIntosh in the session in April, that is something that we could do now, is raise the protected minimum balance and bank arrestments. Uh, council tax is a, a, one of the single biggest debts that we see uh, coming to the bureaus. And when it comes to collection of council tax, local authorities are favouring bank arrestments, and it's becoming a significant issue, especially for our advisors. Now, the protected minimum balance at present is set at just over £566, and quite frankly, it is too low. It is not enough money for anybody uh, to, and, it, and the amount that is arrested is done so regardless of the person's personal situation and household composition. Um, the money that is often taken is also benefit income. And whilst that's technically not allowed to be touched, um, creditors argue that once a benefit hits a person's bank account, it loses its protected status. And what that means is those on the lowest incomes are being left without any means to support themselves, and advisors having to spend time and resources fighting on behalf of clients to recover these debts uh, recover these funds, as well as sourcing like emergency crisis support uh, to provide things as, such as essentials, such as food and energy. So we would like to see the protected minimum balance increase to a thousand, albeit as an emergency measure in the short term, but subject to a wider review to determine a more appropriate long-term level, as well as only seeing a percentage of any income above that one thousand to be subjected to a bank arrestment, using the sliding scale that's already used in earnings arrestment. And we need to see household composition to be taken into account when it comes to protecting minimum balance, because at the moment it is regardless if a person lives on their own or in a household with larger families. And we know that certain groups, such as those with lone parents, families with three or more children, or those with disabilities, face higher living costs and are more likely to live in poverty. Yet bank arrestments have no protections or mitigations for these groups, meaning that they are disproportionately affected by this form of diligence. Thanks, Sarah Jean. Um, I'll bring Emma in. Thank you. Yeah, just to, to build on things that both Peter and um, Sarah Jane have, have said there, um, in terms of government debt, 43 per cent of the clients that access um, support from CAP have universal credit deductions, um, which just makes managing a budget um, in incredibly difficult. Um, and our observations, again, with, with council tax arrears, is, is a very difficult environment for people. Around, around 40 per cent of our clients have council tax arrears when, when they contact us, um, and, and we observe often quick um, and quite hard 
harsh action taken by local authorities, um, which already then just this adds pressure um, to, to circumstances that, that households are, are facing. Um, in terms of the, the opportunities for change within the framework, the, the bank arrestments is, is, is one particular issue, and, and I won't go over everything that Sarah Jane has said, other than to say we wholeheartedly um, agree and would, would advocate everything that she's, she's put in place. But that, that's just one, one thing, as, as the committee are obviously aware. Um, there are different routes out of debt. Um, so we have different statutory solutions that the AIB um, uh, are, are responsible for, and we've been um, working through a review with, with the AIB this year to look at some, some particular issues. And there are some particular things, especially around a map, which is the insolvency option for those on the lowest, lowest incomes um, that we think uh, the AIB and, and indeed this committee could be considering. Um, one of which is the minimum debt threshold for an individual to, to ask to go through bankruptcy. There, that, that is set at £1,500. So you must have £1,500 worth of debt before you can access a map. Um, but experience in case study would, would show us that even debts, you know, around eight, nine, a thousand pounds can be devastating for households on the lowest income, and that removes that option um, of, of insolvency for those households. And even small amounts of debt keep people not even just trapped in debt, but trapped in poverty, um, which I think should be a particular concern really for, for all of us. The other big issue that we are really concerned about that could be coming towards us um, as a direct result of the impact of the cost of living crisis on the lowest households. Um, we talked about this deficit budget, so we're able to work with people now and to get them to become debt free. But we know that it's very unlikely for a number of households that they're going to be able to maintain that debt free status. Under the current arrangements with a MAP, as a debtor, someone who's in debt yourself, you cannot apply for a, um, a MAP again for 10 years. Um, and that's incredibly concerning given the current environment that we, that we are in. Um, people are going to need to access a, a debt solution um, before that point in time. Creditor petition uh, map can happen um, before that, but that's a completely different experience for someone. You, you lose the agency to be able to decide and determine what you would like to do about, about your circumstances. Um, so that's something we feel that we really need to be considering now before it's coming, coming towards us in the next year or two. Thank you, Emma. Um, just following on from some of those <clears throat> responses, in terms of debt with private creditors, do you think that more responsibility could be on the creditors themselves to flag a potential debt arising before it gets to a crisis point? So when looking at debts such as credit cards, credit accounts, catalogues, minimum payments tend to be a real, real issue for people. Um, no one that's making a minimum payment uh, for accrued debt is doing it for any other reason other than that they're in trouble. You're not doing that if, 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 you're, if you've got the money to pay. Um, and creditors allow this to go on end endlessly and it just turns into a horrible, vicious cycle. You're, you're not actually clearing any of the debt that you've raised originally. When looking at food poverty now, people are now getting into debt for essential items with creditors popping up that give people the ability to buy food shoppings on a buy now, pay later basis or over like a three payment basis. Um, and I've got constituents that are paying interest for food items that they bought nine months, 12 months ago. And it's just, it's, it's, it's shocking really. Um, so it's to see if there's any ways that we could catch this before it becomes an issue or if it gets to the stage of like a debt arrangement scheme or a bank or, or well, a bankruptcy, it probably wouldn't be relevant. But looking at reducing that debt by remove, removing even a portion of the interest accrued, or as I say, just flagging it that it's an issue. Um, and obviously, if we get rid of one problem kind of organisation um, in the, these kind of creditors, it seems like another one pops up, like I'm saying, with these sort of food shopping um, organisations. Do you think going forward there's any way that, that we could limit that? Um, because they, they tend to generally be focused and targeted at people on low incomes. So we have Sarah Jane wants to come in on it. I'll bring Sarah Jane in first then, thank you. Yeah. Um, when it in, in regards to uh, credit card debts, and you're right, those on the low who are making the minimum payments aren't doing so because they want to keep their, their debt ongoing. It's because that's usually what they, all they can afford. And it's estimated that if, all, if you only make payments or minimum payments on your credit card, it takes over 30 years in which to clear the debt. 
However, private sector creditors are heavily regulated by the FCA, and in actual fact, they have what's known as the persistent debt policy, which they have to follow. So, if you are only making minimum payments for a set amount of time, which I think is nine months, you will be sent a letter from your credit card company saying that you're in persistent debt and you need to be looking at things like debt advice in order to do it. So, there is a system in place in order to do that with um, private um, creditors. And However, there is not a, re a reciprocal um, policy in public sector debt. So, when you see clients going through, as Emma was saying, and repeated benefit overpayments or um, having things like uh, deductions from benefits, um, there's not a persistent really policy around. Well, if somebody is in this for a long period of time, is there other ways in which we could be dealing with this debt rather than taking constant deductions from their your universal credit, for example? Um, so. When it comes to things like buy now, pay later, and you're correct, you're right. It does feel like once we deal with one um, bad lot, like payday lending, and we brought that under heavily regulation, another one pops up, and buy now, pay later, it seems to be the new one. However, again, the FCA and uh, the regulators are on top of this, and we've already raised this with um, the FCA, and we're looking to bring in tighter regulation around that, hopefully to the same levels that we brought in around payday lending, but not taking as long as it did. But again, it comes down to that public sector. Whilst the private sector is, a, is heavily regulated and there are expectations around things like um, treating vulnerable customers uh, fairly and uh, making sure that those with certain vulnerabilities like mental health rules and regulations are followed, it has not been reciprocated in public sector debt, and that is where we probably need to probably focus more. There are things that we could do when it comes to things like council tax debt, because one of the most important things to note is, yes, people are using credit cards, and yes, they're using them for cost of living essentials, but more people are coming in with priority debt, such as council tax rate and rent arrears. And this is the areas that people are seeing. It is not necessarily credit cards and personal debts like we used to see before. Okay, I know that Emma wanted to come in on this, but can I ask you to follow up in writing? So I've got two more yeah. members with questions, and we are over time. Um, I'll bring in Jeremy Balfour, please. Uh, thank you, Camina, and uh, good morning to everyone. Just a very quick question, really, just following up Emma's last point about maps and insolvency. Uh, what are the negativities of someone going down that road? Because obviously it is a way out, but it, it does come with negativities. Can you just... Tell us a wee bit about if I do go down an insolvency or I enter into a map, what, what are the negativities long term for the clients or are there none? Yeah. I think firstly I would say that um, we have an excellent structure um, with accessing insolvency um, options in Scotland in that you need to go through a money advisor, someone who's trained and accredited to do that. So you are getting that specialist um, help. Therefore, we, we've already kind of put a mechanism like a gate in the process so that the right people are getting on to the right solutions. Um, Nobody, nobody wants to go bankrupt. You know, no one wants to access a map. It is still comes with a huge amount of stigma and taboo within society around, around going through bankruptcy. Um, and it's, a, it's an arduous process. There's a lot of paperwork to fill out. Your life is kind of, kind of unpacked. Um, and people have to share quite a lot of detailed and personal information. So I, th I think it's worth all of us kind of bearing that in mind that, that nobody chooses this solution unless it's, unless it's absolutely um, necessary for them. Um, yes, you're, you're correct. It, it does have some impacts on individuals in terms of accessing uh, credit uh, and moving forward in the future. Um, but people move through a map because it is the best route out of debt for them. That has been carefully considered by a money advisor because, like, like the examples uh, even that Sarah Jane just described there, that uh, an alternative, a DAS, could, could be 30 years pay, paying back, back a debt. We, we had an example come through the office last week where uh, like a repayment option for somebody would be 50, 50 years to, to pay the debt back. Uh, and None of us could live like that. People's well-being and health is, is absolutely essential. So perhaps whilst, yes, there are some short-term, what I would describe as implications of going through a map, um, if, if that is what's been advised by a money advisor, um, it is probably guaranteed to be the right solution for somebody. And just one clarification in regard to your comment about the 10 years before you can enter into a new one, mm -hmm. um, with, and maybe the others can write on this, um, what scale would you be looking for? Is it a three-year, four-year? Yeah. You know, have you thought about 
what would be the appropriate length yeah. of time? A great question. Uh, I was Sarah Jane and some other colleagues and I were literally just discussing this, this issue not, not that long ago. I think it's helpful for the committee to know that the comparable route out of debt um, in England and Wales is a DRO, um, and that is six years um, for you to be able to re-enter re that. Um, and so that, that's something to, to bear in mind. I think what we need to do is look at the backdrop of the economic circumstances that we are facing and be able to have a system that is flexible uh, and to meet the needs that, that, that are facing us. We, we are about to have crisis emergency needs. Therefore, it is potential, Jeremy, that we might choose to do something for a limited period of time to best meet the needs of people weathering the current economic crisis and then return to a figure that might be uh, you know, agreed more, more long term. So something about flexibility would be the, the thing that we would consider. And you may not know the answer to it, so I am putting you on the spot, or the others on the spot. My understanding is that that would require primary legislation to change those things. Is, is that correct? Yes, that is my, that is my under, understanding um, as well. Yeah. Thank you, Camino. Thanks very much for that, Jeremy. And we have a question from um, Faisal Chowdhury, who joins us online. Thank you, convener. Uh, good morning, panel. Uh, I'll just make it very short, uh, and uh, the question will be for the panel. Uh, do you find uh, variation in the issue faced by people from BME as compared to the rest of the population? Uh, is there an issue of multiple disadvantage faced by these groups? Thanks very much for that, Foisal. And uh, you dropped out a little bit, but I think this question is round about is there um, a, a specific impact on, on the BME community? Um, and I don't know who you want to, to bring that to, Foisal. Do you want to bring it to um, Citizens Advice Scotland? Do you want to bring it to Sarah Jane? Sarah Jane, um, then Citizen Advice, please, yeah. Yeah. Sarah Jane, can we hear from you on that? Yes. And on the short answer, yes, there is. Um, we, Emma, um, commented earlier that it can take up to a year for somebody um, before, even when they've reached crisis point, to go and seek help. And we find those in um, BME communities is even longer. And that is because in some communities and some uh, cultures, the stigma around debt is even higher. So seeking help and um, and trying to reach out for help can be seen as, as deeply shameful and that adds another layer to um, getting support. There's also um, issues around language barriers. Um, certainly in my time as a, a money advisor, I help support many, many um, people from um, BME backgrounds and communities and you know having to bring in an interpreter or even using their children to come in and interpret um, and uh, translate and talk through an issue, which can be very difficult because you never know if the translation is going to be exactly what needs to be said, and um, and that can add different challenges as well. Um, so we do definitely see that there are variations and um, there is different levels of um, poverty and there's different uh, demographics coming into play, especially around um, these communities. Uh, so obviously we try to make sure that we can be as welcoming and uh, and and work with other community um, services that are already supporting clients in these backgrounds so that we are um, seen to be working together rather than trying to compete or to, to um, be seen as somebody that you don't go to or somebody that you don't speak to. Thanks very much for that, Sarah Jane. And I do have a question, but I'm actually going to ask if people can follow up in writing, but I will ask it. Mm -hmm. um, so yesterday there was a report from the, the Lloyds Banking Foundation um, entitled Drivers of Poverty. Um, and there was a huge part of that was round about what Sarah Jane's already touched on, those deductions from benefits and my past experience of working with people um, in, in debt. Um, that was always a big issue. There was always this perpetual deduction off benefits. Um, and some of the drivers for that we know are round about um, recouping advances, um, historical debt from the clunky tax credit system that people get surprised by, etc. Um, and obviously this is driving that um, debt um, where people just can never get out of debt because it's you know, these essential things that they've got to pay. So I'm wondering if, if your organisations can maybe write to us whether you agree with the recommendations that are coming out of that report um, about writing off these historical debts, about doing a full review of the system um, of, of clawback from 
benefits, which essentially are the minimum that people are supposed to live on, but they're not means tested at this point. And it was very interesting to hear Sarah Jane say about once they hit the bank account, or was it Emma? Somebody said once they hit the bank account, they're not protected anymore. Um, so I would just be, you know, I think the committee would like to hear um, your, your thoughts on that report and the recommendations that came out of it, if that's possible. So thank you very much to everybody um, this morning for coming along. Sorry that we did run over time, um, but I'm going to pause to um, allow the panels to change over and for members to have a, a short comfort break. Um, so I suspend the meeting just now. Thank you very much.
Welcome back, um, everyone. Our second, second panel um, are all joining us remotely, or are we still suspended? I'll start that again. Um, welcome back, everyone. Our second panel are all joining us remotely um, this morning, and I welcome Zara Hussain, Mental Health and Money Advice um, Senior Advisor, um, Mental Health UK, Hannah Brisbane, Public Affairs Assistant, Scottish Association for Mental Health, Rebecca Stacey, Senior Research Officer, Money and Mental Health Policy Institute, and Wendy McCausland, Development Coordinator um, at Voices of Experiences and Mental Health Foundation Scotland. Um, and as we have run over time, and we are um, quite short for time this morning, um, I'm going to head straight into questions from members, and um, I'll have Emma Roddick kick us off this morning. Emma, please. Thank you, convener. Yeah. First off, I wanted to, to pick up on something raised by Support in Mind in their written submission, um, that people with mental health problems often don't have the energy and motivation to improve their situation. Um, and I think as well as being financially poor, there's maybe not enough of an understanding of how you can be energy and time poor at the same time. Um, is there enough understanding um, within services, and I suppose in, in this building as well, of how exhausting it is to be worried constantly and, and working constantly without an end in sight? Um, and I think I'll go to, to Sam H first, if that's OK. Over to yourself, Hannah. Thanks very much for that question. Um, good morning. Thanks for having us along. Um, I think in general, probably not. There's not enough awareness in um, of those particular issues. Um, that's something I know that people using our services feel uh, feel feel a lot in terms of the impact that me their mental health can have on um, you know that um, their energy levels, particularly um, symptoms of mental health problems, can cause things like brain fog and memory problems. Um, and those can have a real impact um, in trying to deal with daily finances. You talked a lot in the first panel about um, budgeting. That can be really difficult if you've got a mental health problem, um, trying to keep track of all your finances um, and you know, dealing with paying bills and online banking as well. Um, so I think in terms of awareness, um, in general, public awareness isn't there of those at the moment, but also in debt advice services, in banking services, financial services as well. Um, we would certainly like to see awareness around those issues raised. Do you have any further on that, Emma? Yeah, just, just one follow-up, um, and I suppose this is, this is for anyone with a particular interest. Um, Along the same vein, is there enough being done to support children who are living in households who are in that situation? Because it is obviously going to be quite traumatic growing up, knowing that you know your your parents are struggling and are exhausted all the time. Can we start back with Hannah on that? And then I should have said at the beginning for anybody else that wants to come in, if you can type an R in the chat box, I can monitor that here and bring you in. Um, yeah, I think um, we certainly from our children and young people services, they um, are aware of the impact that you know mental health problems in households um, can have. I'm aware that the um, money and pension service are um, beginning their kind of implementation of their delivery plan in Scotland around um, their UK financial wellbeing strategy, and I, I believe there's actions in that to look at the place of schools in. Um, and not just mental health problems in that respect, but also um, finan financial education as well, um, and, and aiming that not just at children and young people, but parents and using schools as those kind of places and communities that um, parents are already accessing and, and places that they can get that information. And we've got Wendy who would like to come in on this point. Hi there. It was just really in relation to the first part um, that you mentioned there about whether there was enough understanding of um, the difficulties that people with mental health problems face. And I think in terms of what matters, um, what, what really matters to them, it's it's not so much information that they need to be able to help themselves get out of debt. It's things like just that kind of general support. It's not about knowledge. It's about things like um, decision making pro processes. It's about depression impact on motivation. Um, and other factors that really mean that people feel quite terrified, they're scared and they, they don't know where to start, they don't open up mail, they, they don't want to go there. So I think it's just, for me, it's just making it really clear it's not about a sort of information cognitive related um, issue, it's more about that kind of feelings that people have. 
Thanks very much for that, Wendy. Um, Emma, do you have anything further at this point? No, that's no. me. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm, I'll bring in Miles Briggs now for his questions. Uh, thank you, convener. Good morning uh, to the panel. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I wanted to ask a few questions with regards to debt and suicide, and specifically to start off with, with regards to since the publication of um, the research in 2018 um, by the Money and Mental Health Policy Institute, what reassessment has taken place with regards to the um, scale of the problem of suicide and debt? And I'll maybe bring Rebecca in, and if anyone else wants to comment on that. Thanks for inviting us to give evidence today. So, in short, um, the Institute, the Money Mental Health Policy Institute, hasn't done as wide a scale as, as in, an investigation into that link between debt and suicide since that publication. But a couple of points to make. First, being the findings from that are still really relevant and stand. That debt between um, that link between debt and suicide suicidality is really strong. What we did do last year is we did a bit of research that kind of took stock of the state of the nation's financial and mental health. Um, and as part of that, we did again look into that link between struggling financially and being at risk of suicide. And we found that 2.5 million adults in the UK with a mental health problem either considered or attempted to take their own life while behind on a payment during the pandemic. So that issue is still really um, prevalent and those findings are really concerning. A really important point to make though when discussing debt and suicide is that um, the reasons why someone decides to take their own life is always very complex and multifaceted. And it's really important to consider the number of different factors that will be at play behind that um, decision when considering that link between debt and suicide. Miles, do you have any further? Um, and, and just to link into that question, in the earlier session, we heard um, the ask really around training, around uh, advice uh, referrals within mental health services. Um, so in your opinion, um, do you think that the current uh, mental health and suicide prevention strategies um, adequately look towards um, the role that financial difficulties can play? Um, and how would you like to see that change as well in terms of uh, that ask, which we heard earlier? Uh, so, in short, there's been some steps towards acknowledging that people who are economically vulnerable are at greater risk of suicide, but a lot more needs to be done as part of those prevention strategies to both yeah, further establish and make that point about that link between financial difficulty and suicide, and, and actions need to be taken on the back of that, and building on what was mentioned in the earlier session. So, a key part of that is mental health services and healthcare professionals working within them being able to better identify people who are at risk of um, suicide as a result of, say, for example, in part, their financial difficulty. And a key part of that is empowering healthcare professionals within these services to be able to have those questions and make those inquiries about how someone's financial situation is impacting on their mental health. And there's two key parts of that. The, the first part is around that issue of, of training and, and having sort of a, a training module for healthcare professionals around money and mental health but also embedding um, within, within processes in healthcare, within mental health care settings, um, more financial prompts. So, for example, in Wales, in health and care, mental, health, mental health care and treatment plans there, they have a specific financial prompt. And that's something which we'd really be looking for the other nations um, as part of the UK to, to implement as well. And second to that, it's really important when healthcare professionals have, have identified and made that inquiry about someone's finances, that they're then able to refer people onto the adequate support that they need to help mitigate that risk of them um, being at risk of suicide or, or their financial and their mental health worsening. So as part of that, it's about having warm referral routes from mental health settings to advice settings. But a really important point to make is that for people with more severe mental illness, so people in secondary mental health care settings, that expectation that people are in a position to act on signposting and act on referral routes isn't realistic. And, and for those sorts of people, we're also wanting to see more of an integration with, with debt and money advice being provided within mental health settings themselves, both primary and secondary. And there's been some good steps towards that happening in primary health care settings, but we want to see more of that taking place in secondary. And with that increased knowledge from healthcare professionals, there then can be better referrals onto sort of schemes of support, which we can come on and, and maybe discuss in a bit around, say, for example, 
um, breathing space or, or moratorium and, and the potential for a mental health breathing space, as well as, as Sarah Jane was talking about, better support in terms of completing things like debt and mental health evidence forms. Thanks for that, Rebecca. And I can see that we have um, Zara and Hannah who want to come in. Over to yourself, Sarah, first. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah. And uh, what I'd like to talk is that I've seen such a large increase within suicide and uh, debt. Um, I had a, a client, I, I'm a frontline worker, and I've been working in uh, debt advice for, for roughly about five years. And uh, the amount of people that have have had uh, you know, suicide or severe mental or health conditions, I've even had clients who've suffered heart attacks due to the pressures of the uh, debts and the pressures of creditors coming um, by text messages, by phone. Um, it's, it's really, really challenging for vulnerable people. Uh, the cost of living has increased. Um, it's a vicious circle. Uh, there's limited protection, especially since COVID, you know, restrictions have lessened. There needs to be more um, empathy you know, towards the uh, um, people that are vulnerable. We use the tools such as the depth and mental health evidence form. But what happens when these forms don't work with creditors? Or, and, uh, you know, um, so, for example, uh, I was uh, at the client with just means tested benefits. Um, will never get better. Years of uh, mental health issues, thirty years, and uh, um, has uh, been has been in hospital because they've been sectioned. They've gone to such serious parts stages in their lives, but yet creditors, even though you write such detailed letters and you provide evidence, uh, you know, from uh, using debt mental health evidence from psych psychologists to uh, trusted professions. Yet those things are not taken into account, and they'll um, sometimes they won't acknowledge, uh, you know, us the uh, workers that are in the front line, and they won't, um, you know, think about the person who's suicidal. If I have, if I speak about one client who tried to hang herself or tried to um, jump off a bridge at least twice a week during COVID. Do you know, what do you think the impact will have on the family? It's not. It doesn't affect one person. It affects the whole family. It can affect the community. We need to look at the bigger picture. We need to make changes. We need to make changes within the advice. We need to think about how can we um, stop the spiraling debt, the stress that you know pushes on people's mental health. I mean, you income, you know, the living cost and income. It's becoming a lot more challenging. You, if you can have the working poor, even if you're, if you're not eligible for benefits, you can have the working poor, and you can have people that are single without kids. I'm not talk I know that people with kids is really very difficult, but someone in universal credit on limited income who doesn't have additional means, it's just uh, what are they going to choose between eating? Are they okay? They're heating. Okay, heating might not be as high as what it would be in the winter. But if uh, you know they've got disabilities, uh, I've got someone with uh, a car and they can't even plug it in because the, they've got an electric car because the the high cost of the uh, uh, fuel costs. Uh, it's just a vicious circle. Uh, I, I could keep going on, but I really need to give other people a chance. Uh, but I just want to say, please have a uh, you know. Creditors and local authorities arresting people's uh, bank, uh, uh, making bank arrestments. How can we, you know, leave someone with just five hundred sixty-six pounds and say that's enough to live on? We know the cost of living. You just even get, you can't even get a standard social housing, and you have to go into the private sector. And are you telling me you can get a property for um, six hundred pounds? Or even five hundred pounds, and where are you going to eat? Where are you going to pay your energy? Where are you going to pay your living costs? How does that sort of? I don't understand that. Um, when they arrest your wages, and then you've got an added twenty-five pound uh, uh, court order, so it's not just that five hundred sixty. It adds on and all these other costs. We are just, uh, you know, um, seeing the impact 
that to, you know, um, two side and uh, debt is having and uh, and even health matters because, uh, like I mentioned, that person who had a heart attack. I just don't know what else I can say, but I'll let other people speak. As I said, sorry. <laughs> Thanks for that, Zarin. I do think that you've painted um, the picture of the firefighting that, that you're doing on the front line with people as they, they try and navigate um, the, the situation they find themselves in. Um, and can I bring in Hannah briefly here, and then I've got Wendy as well who wants to come in. Um, but we will have lots of other members' questions, so we do need to, to keep it brief if we can. Hannah, please. Sure, thank you. Just to quickly bring it back to the question about um, suicide prevention strategies. Um, certainly, the current National Suicide Prevention Plan does recognise um, at-risk groups, including people in poverty, um, although there's not currently an action dedicated to that. Um, it's something we would like to see, you know, this relationship between poverty and debt and mental health acknowledged in the new strategy that the government's currently developing. Um, and in particular, I would like to see um, a focus, this focus in local suicide prevention plans um, and um, the local implementation of those as well. Um, they are currently, you know, varied across the country in terms of what will be in those based on their local needs. Um, but we would definitely argue that debt should be um, acknowledged in those as well. A really um, good example of local work that's happening in this country at the moment is the um, Distress Brief Intervention Programme that um, quickly um, signpost people who um, are in distress to um, support in their communities, such as debt advice, money advice, based on what they, they need. Um, and we would like to see that rolled out nationally um, on a face-to-face -face basis, as opposed to the current telephone model that is currently being used. Thanks for that, Hannah and Wendy. Uh, yeah, it was just to really build on some of the things that Rebecca was mentioning earlier, and just to say, I think that certainly for people with existing mental health problems, there's a real need for clinicians um, and, and health staff to be able to pick up on some of the, the issues around, around debt and economic rights. I think certainly up until now, it's been very much about um, people's symptoms and, and reducing symptoms, but we really need to be making sure that we, we've got a sort of process of understanding the set up that the situation people are in in terms of their, their finances. I think unless we do that, um, a lot of, of our members, for example, they wouldn't be necessarily linking in with um, debt advice or citizen advice bureau. You know, many of them they they don't go out. They don't have a lot of things that they tend to to sort of have a lot of contacts, especially those with with complex mental health problems. So it was just really to say that we need to find ways to pick up on those people who are have. You know, spiraling debts and who don't see very many people other than maybe their, their clinical support. Thank you for, for that, Wendy. Um, and I'm now going to move on to questions from Pam Duncan Glancy, who is online. Pam? Thank you, um, and uh, good morning to the panel. Thanks again for all the evidence you've provided so far and for the information that you've, that you've shared in advance. Um, and I, I said this earlier um, in, in another panel, but some of the a, a lot actually of what we're hearing this morning is just horrific to hear. I can't imagine what it's like to have to deliver the services and also to experience what um, what you've described um, from a, a, a direct experience point of view is just horrific. Um, I have a, a couple of questions, um, if that's okay, um, for for theme um, one and three together, which, which I'll direct if it's all right at Mental Health UK and Vox. Um, we, we know that there are related um, mental health and debt issues are, are, are related, and much of the evidence that we've, we've seen in advance acknowledges that. Um, can, you, can you say a little bit about what that would mean for how we should deliver services? And I know you have touched on some of that so far. How we can break the link between mental health and debt, and how can we help identify people who will need that additional support? What specific actions could the government in Scotland take to, to do that? Thanks. And who do you want to direct that to, Pam? Um, if it's okay, the, um, maybe Zara and um, Wendy, please. Thanks. Thank you. Zara, can we start with yourself? Yeah, yeah, of course. So, you know, um, uh, you mentioned about breaking the link uh, with the. You really need to have support in place. So, you know, there's been so much cutback in support. Uh, services such as uh, you know psychiatrists, psychologists. I'm talking about services uh, within our NHS. Uh, even senior GP is really, really difficult. Um, we we have limited, uh, you know, if not face to face or just getting an appointment. 
Um, I know someone, you know, um, a client, obviously, uh, it took three years just to see a psychiatrist, three years, um, three years, some t for some people is three years too late. Uh, if you want to try and break a link uh, between debt and uh, mental health, you need to start obviously um, tackling, you know, putting putting things in place. Like, for example, um, think about the council tax. I'm just going to talk about something random, which I see on a daily basis. Well, daily, it feels like daily, but so often um, people um, of all walks of life that experienced um, council tax uh, arrears, which are sometimes, uh, you know, because of their mental health being so bad that they are just struggling. But how can you break the link if your money is being taken out? Um, it's, you know, at your bank account has been arrested. We're just going through a vicious circle. Um, you need to try Try and cut down, you know, when you have someone who has, you know, that has got severe mental health issues. It's, you know, for example, the, our mental health money advice service, we we usually get a lot of clients who reach it at crisis point. As Mendy mentioned, you know, I'm part of the Support Mind Scotland, and we have the DBI, that's the Distress Brief Intervention um, Service, and the, the people that get referred to our service are at crisis point. Often people that have committed suicide, and uh, so they are at the lowest uh, of the point. And you need to bring in, you need to bring in services. Services. I'll just keep banging away. Services until we get these services back up and running in a timely way. Three years. Three years. You know, surely that's not right. Um, it's trying to see your GP. You know. Um, when it's really serious, you know, um, not helping. We work with carers, but then, you know, if uh, if they're watching, let's say, the, well, I have one client, their daughter trying to commit suicide, where are they supposed to go? Um, so how can we break this cycle? We can, it's really impossible unless you put in barriers, you know, to manage people's debt, um, put in Action, that action is not so severe for people that they have to be forced into um, taking their own lives or having heart attacks or having such experiences, um, and uh, you know, um, putting more force. Well, put more force. I don't. I don't want to be sound like a monster, but just to have a little bit of understanding, have a bit of empathy. Um, do you know? I, I do you know. I know it's not built with everybody, but just sort of think: What if you were in that position? Nobody chooses to go and kill themselves. Nobody chooses just to have debt. You know, you have credit cards thrown at you, um, and uh, you've already, for example, had a bankruptcy, but you're on the highest APR. So you're going to go back into that vicious circle because of cost of living. So if you can't. Protect, you know, leave money in your bank account. Um, like I mentioned, increase that protected minimum amount. That is not reflective on someone, um, on someone's just living living life. But increase those amounts, um, and get the Scottish government to make these changes because, you know, we need to let people live, and we need to let families live. We need to let communities live. And we need to um, not have people. Sorry, Zara. You know, I'll need people. to bring. I'll need to bring Wendy yes. in. But you are underlining some of the points that we've heard previously, especially around about that leaving the minimum income within the banks. And we will be speaking to um, council tax next week. Um, so the evidence that we're taking on that is going to help us um, to formulate our questions going forward. Um, can I bring in Wendy um, and then back to yourself, Pam, if you have another question? Yeah, thank you. I think it's a, it's a really complex question to answer, but so important. I think that we certainly know that our members are, are three and a half times more likely to be in problem debt and also four times more likely to be in arrears with their gas and electricity. So we know already that we've, we've got a group of people who are at, at real risk um, in terms of, of debt problems cycling. So I think in terms of Sort of addressing the issue that's that's been there for for a number of years for our members and is, is just going to get worse. Um, there, there's issues that are just the kind of issues: employment, underemployment, 
um, people being in, in sort of jobs that have a lot of turnover, um, low paid jobs. And I think on top of that as well, you've got people, we have a benefit system that doesn't, I don't think fully understands um, the fact that, that mental health isn't about the sort of things that the assessments ask, you know, and it, it just doesn't quite fit right. So you've got people who are, are obviously in a situation where they're much more likely to to experience it. And I think to be able to address that, we have to address things like underemployment, we have to address unemployment, we have to look at the benefit system and make sure that it's really suitable for, for people with mental health problems. And the last thing I would like to say about this is, I think certainly the Scott Review just now, which is looking at mental health legislation, is looking at ensuring that we really prioritise social and economic rights. And I think one of the concepts that they're looking at is something called human rights enablement. And I'm quite quite hopeful that this could be a, a vehicle to make sure that people access rights, economic rights, and that we, we make sure there's a, a sort of um, real drive towards not just sort of supporting somebody and signposting them to where they can go, but making sure that somebody must get those services if their rights are going to be upheld. Thank you for that, Wendy. Pam, did you have a further question? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Wendy and Zara and uh, convener. Um, not on this theme, but I do have another couple on other themes. Would you like me to do them just now or come back in if there's time? Um, I, I think this time I'll need to move on and then I'll bring you back in just to make sure that everybody gets um, their opportunity. Okay. Um, can I move to a question from Faisal Chowdhury, who's also online, please? Thank you very much, convener, and good morning to the panel. Uh, we talked about, uh, I mean, Pam just asked a question about uh, the cycle. Um, how can we best break the cycle of debt, mental health problems? Is there an evidence for some policy approaches working better than others? Uh, I would ask that to Hannah. Or... Yep, Hannah, if we can bring you in, please. Yeah, thanks very much for that question. Um, I'd say just to echo what others have said in the previous response, that. Uh, Prevention and early intervention of both mental health problems and debt will, will always be key um, to even you know stopping the cycle from forming in the first place. Um, SAMH has, for example, has been calling for better mental health support in this country. Um, for us, the mental health system was already struggling before the cost of living crisis and before the pandemic. We really need to, need to be seeing more investment in communities for mental health support at that level um, so people can access that as early as possible. Um, we also need to ensure that people are able to meet basic costs um, through you know, things that have already been mentioned, higher wages, social security payments, um, as well as ensuring be the better take-up of benefits as well. Um, I know the University of Glasgow um, have recently published some research into universal credit and the experiences of um, people with mental health problems receiving that um, and found that they were struggling to meet their, their basic needs and often relying on family and friends to help with that. Um, participants were also often unaware of emergency financial support that was in place, such as the Scottish Welfare Fund, for example. So we need to also ensure that people um, have better incomes to meet their daily needs, but um, are also using all of the current um, support that is available to them as well. Um, thank you. Thanks for that. And do we also um, have Rebecca and then Zara briefly, who want to come in on this question as well. Rebecca, please. Yeah, just... Hi, yeah, yeah, thanks. Just to pick up on a couple of points. So I think it's fair to say there's a number of different actors involved in, in breaking that link between having a mental health problem and experiencing difficulty. And I kind of buy quite a top line view of, of who those are and what some of those actions are and some that are specific to the Scottish Government as well, which we would really like to see. So the first one is, is firms, essential services firms. It's really important that they have are providing services which are accessible by by default to people with mental health problems and providing better support to customers with mental health problems, whether that's provision of more um, suitable repayment plans, um, touching on issues raised earlier about um, challenges when you have a mental health problem in terms of concentration and, men, um, and processing large amounts of information, potentially sort of providing transcripts and follow up to um, interactions with customers with mental health problems. There's also a big role that obviously advice services have to play, but I think it's fair to say at the moment, a lot of our research community members um, which is a network of people with mental health problems who, who drive our research and our, and our policy calls. A lot of them struggle to both access, um, understand and act on some of the advice that's given. And I think a big challenge that um, advice providers have, have talked to us about is the fact that their funding models don't necessarily facilitate providing that more bespoke and tailored support that, that clients with more complex needs like those with mental health problems might need. So we've got calls for sort of funders of the advice to 
to take into consideration those more um, complex needs when, when funding debt advice. And, and that could look at things along the lines of having complex ACE premiums, maybe, or ring fence funding for sort of more specialist debt advice for people with mental health problems. And then finally, um, there's also the role of, of mental health services as well. And I don't want to repeat what I said earlier, but I think as part of that, um, there's certain schemes which we'd really like to see the government, Scottish government sort of implement, which are linked to um, mental health services um, and can help improve access to them. And, and the first is around having a sort of similar breathing space for people who are going through a mental health crisis like we do um, in England and Wales. So, so something similar that works with the moratorium system in Scotland here. That is a really useful tool to try and help ensure people um, who are struggling with their mental health and finances are able to access that breathing space and that, and that respite. And also through removing um, barriers in the form of charges of, of GPs charging for debt and mental health evidence forms. That's another really important change that um, can help ensure people with mental health problems are able to get better support from, from their creditors, um, hopefully, if they accept that form. Um, but overarching to all of that as well is, is the issue of income. And that's why the, the UK government more widely is absolutely vital. More is done to both ensure that benefit rates uh, are invested in to keep keep pace with the cost of living and also to restore some of those cuts that have taken place more recently. So, so restoring the 20 pounds uplift, but also rates such as the limited capability for work rate on UC and the work related activity group rate on ESA as well. Thanks very much for that, Rebecca. Um, I, I'm going to move on to, to the next question um, from from Miles Briggs. Um, just if there are, are any follow-up things that mem the members of the panel do want to to um, make us aware of, please do follow up in writing because we're not going to have time, I think, to get round um, everything that everybody wants to say this morning. So I'll, I'll move back to Miles Briggs, please. Th thank you, Kavino. I just wanted to ask one question with regards to accessing uh, help and support. And it was about early intervention. So I just wondered, um, from your experience, what scope there is um, to identify people, do you think, um, earlier, um, and then to be able to look towards that referral? And that isn't necessarily... Um, you know, within a mental health context, but in, in terms of other organisations who might be in contact with individuals who are financially vulnerable. And who do you want to direct that to? Um, I'll maybe start with Rebecca, as you're up on the screen, and then see if anyone else wants to come in. Yeah, sure. So I think, yeah, in addition to mental health services, there's a role that essential services firms um, have to play, um, as well as advice services. And I think from a central services point of view, in terms of making that identification, there is certain data that they should be using to potentially identify people who are more vulnerable financially and therefore might be at risk of, of struggling both with their finances and their mental health. And one thing we've always said is that there should be more proactive identification of those customers, but also for people who do disclose better provision of support. So we know through re research we've done that one in three people with a mental health problem who've disclosed this mental health problem to an essential services firm haven't had any additional support on the back of that. So obviously that's a great concern. And one, one key thing that, that these services could be doing is, is yeah, once they've identified or, or someone has disclosed, referring to advice services that do exist. I think there's a big opportunity there, um, which, yeah, isn't, isn't as fully being utilised as it could be at the moment. Um, and again, with advice services, we know that, um, you know, sometimes they can, people can, with mental health problems, can be struggling to, to access these services. And, and in some cases, we've heard of accounts of people not disclosing their mental health problem to an advice service, either because they don't feel like it would affect the advice provided, or they maybe um, don't understand how the yeah, advisor might not understand the impact that's having on their situation. So again, I think there's a big opportunity there for advice services to be, yeah, more empowered, I think, in a big way through through funding models to sort of take that time and, and provide that more bespoke and tailored advice to people with mental health problems. Thank you. Many thanks for that, Rebecca. Miles, do you have a further question yeah. there? Time no, I could I bring my colleague Pam Duncan Glancy back in for a couple of questions that she has? Thank you. Um, thank you, convener. I yeah, I was keen just to ask a little bit about the current landscape of services, if that's okay. So maybe I would direct the, the following questions to um, Sam H um, and also to the Mental Health um, Policy uh, Institute, if that's all right. Um, what is your understanding of the funding environment in which those or your organisations are working and has that had an impact on their ability to, to provide mental health support, um, but also uh, debt support? And I guess 
and that goes for debt advisors and their role um, in terms of providing mental health support as well. So it works both ways. And then my second question is about the breathing space in England um, mechanism. It's slightly different to our moratorium here, as you'll know. So I was just wondering, do you think that and should we um, could we and should we extend this in Scotland, the moratorium, to ensure creditors don't contact people at all and for a longer period as you've um, as long as someone is experiencing crisis? Thanks. Thanks for that, Pam. So if we can start um, with Hannah and then Rebecca, um, as those are the, the organisations you've directed your questions to. So, Hannah, first, please. Yeah, um, I think I would just echo on the point about funding, what was already mentioned in the previous session. Um, definitely, we would be calling for um, multi-year funding um, as a better way of you know, protecting the services that we have in place. Um, and um, making you know more consistency um, between tenders in terms of the reforms to um, aspects like breathing space down south. Um, I know that um, the Money and Mental Health Policy Institute were quite instrumental in getting that um, secured down south. So Rebecca will probably have more to say. Um, and you know, Sam H, we're not um, debt solutions experts, but we can definitely feed in um, our point of view on the mental health aspect of this. Um, and that would be you know it, it would make sense for us to have provisions like um, exist in, in England to support to protect people with mental health problems. I think we would have questions around um, should that look exactly the same up here, um, particularly you know, should people have to be in crisis before they have access to the protection um, that that scheme offers and um, around the 30 day period after um, someone has completed their treatment for their mental health crisis. I think um, I think that the scheme in England would be a good opportunity for us in Scotland to take learning from from that. But I think we could maybe ad ad adopt it um, a bit differently up here. Thanks for that. And can we hear from Rebecca, please? Yeah, sure. So without wanting to repeat um, too much what I stated earlier, but in terms of funding, I think the main the main challenges that we hear from advice providers um, of debt advisors is around the issue of not provide being able to provide that, that more bespoke and tailored advice to people with mental health problems. So people with mental health problems in our research community have told us that um, quite often they would benefit from sort of more frequent but shorter advice sessions, um, which could help with things like attention span and also challenges around um, digesting large amounts of information when it's provided. They've also told us that they quite often struggle to both um, understand and also follow up on advice that's given. Um, so we would be ideally looking for sort of more um, intense follow up advice being provided to people, but. As we talked about, um, there isn't always that ability within funding models at the moment. So we'd really be asking funders of debt advice to, to consider those requirements and not penalise services for, for providing that um, level of tailored support. And an additional point to make in terms of access to advice is around the provision of face-to-face -face debt advice. So again, it's really important, especially for people with mental health problems. 75% um, of whom struggle with at least, at least one main communication channel, the main one being the telephone. It's really important that they are able to access advice services in a, in a variety of formats um, and also through the ability of, of drop-ins as well as as well as sort of yeah more online appointments. On the point of um, mental health breathing space, so it's absolutely something we would be calling on the Scottish government to consider implementing um, in a similar in a similar sense to what we have down in England. And I can kind of touch on a couple of points why um, we campaign for it, and it's and it's really important. It's been really important. Um, for us to have that tacked onto our conventional breathing space, which I think kind of helped make the case for a similar programme in, in Scotland. So the first, um, for the conventional breathing space in England and Wales, the first um, point is around the fact that to access that, you needed to be accessing um, uh, debt advice. But we know that, especially for people who um, are struggling with more severe mental illness and who are in crisis, that expectation just isn't at all realistic. And so it really needed to be sort of yeah, available to people who are in crisis care and weren't able to be accessing more conventional forms of, of money advice. And secondly, someone's mental health crisis, you know, there's no saying how long that's going to last. And the prospect of having sort of a moratorium or a breathing space um, respite cut out during someone's mental health crisis is detrimental and, and provides a real risk to both exacerbating their mental and their financial health. So another key part of, of the mental health breathing space in England and Wales is, is having it last as long as your as your as long as your crisis lasts with that buffer period. So yeah, we'd be calling for something similar in Scotland. Obviously, I, I'm, as far as I'm aware, the, the 
terms for sort of accessing moratorium are slightly different and don't necessarily require um, access to a, a debt advisor. But again, that principle of if someone is in crisis, you know, they, that needs to be automatically sort of offered to them instead of the expectation that it's on them to sort of apply to it or, or seek advice in applying to it. I think one key sort of learning maybe which we would suggest um, to the Scottish Government to consider based on our experience of having that implemented in England is around implementing it in conjunction with healthcare professionals. And that's for a number of reasons. That's both to increase awareness of a scheme um, if it is implemented. So I think that is a challenge that we face in England um, and Wales at the moment is, is maybe not as great as, as awareness among healthcare professionals of mental health breathing space. But also so that healthcare professionals working within mental health settings in Scotland could suggest who best was um, placed to sign off on, on access to a mental health breathing space equivalent here. Um, so that's something which we would sort of, yeah, encourage to be considered in terms of the implementation. Thanks very much for that, Rebecca um, and Hannah. I think that really helps us in terms of, of um, the evidence that we need to, to hear and to take. Um, I'm going to bring my colleague Emma Roddick back in to be followed by Paul McLennan. Emma. Thank you, convener. Um, I'm going to go back to, to Hannah for this one. Um, just thinking about stigma, which we know prevents a lot of people from coming forward to seek help. Um, do you find that this is worse when there are children involved? Are people anxious about what admitting having difficulties will mean for um, custody of children or even the, the stigma that, that their kids might face? Hannah, can we hear from you? Um, I don't actually have, um, you know, experience of that in, in my role at SAMH. It's certainly something I can um, look into and um, chat to colleagues and see me and ask them to follow up in writing about that as well. Um, see me as Scotland's anti-stigma programme, so I'm sure they'd be happy to. Yep, I think we want to, um, Zara wants to come in on that um, as a frontline worker, Zara. Oh. Right, okay. Um, I just want to say, you know, that to um, COVID and, uh, and the restrictions brought many challenges and stigma uh, increased in services. So the problem being that, you know, a lot of issues weren't um, handled in a constructive manner. And unfortunately, you know, um, when it's in a family environment, children, you know, live in the space of, the, you know, the adults, the parents. And what often happens is that goes back in the school and uh, unfortunately, you know, when someone has mental health issues and uh, it's, uh, you know, sort of, well, it goes down to the children um, who struggle at school, but the limit of services, it's just not helping children. And uh, there's more issues that are happening. You know, there's a lot of prejudice about mental health. There's a stigma if you don't, if the, you know, you don't dress appropriately, if you don't, um, if you're colour, if you have a disability, that's another issue, um, uh, and uh, if uh, you know, there are just so many discrimination um, that are happening, and it's just actually happening more openly. Uh, you'll see children who are truanting. And uh, unfortunately, that's having an impact outside of school, outside the environment. So here, you know, you need to sort of look about how can we better provide services, you know, which unfortunately have stopped uh, um, for children's services, such as, you know, community centres and that, you know, you just don't have them. Thanks very much for that. And I think that we do see some um, incidents across the country where you can see best practice where they've brought home link workers in and financial inclusion into schools. And that helps to kind of start to drive down that stigma um, that we do know exists. Because as you said, children live in the space where their parents live and they experience those same things. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I'll move on to a question from Paul McLennan, please. Yeah, thanks, Convener. I was going to ask a question about stigma, but I think that's been answered. I just wanted to ask it around, around about the role of community link workers. Uh, and as you know, they kind of originated in deep end GP practices in, in Glasgow. Where do you see the role of community link workers in, in the next months and, and years ahead? Um, I don't know who will want to answer that one. Um, maybe go to yourself, Zara, to, to, to ask that one, but just open it up to the panel after that. Mm -hmm. OK. Um... Unfortunately, you know, it's not easy to get a community link worker, you know, I mean, it's great when you do have a community link worker, but there's limitations, uh, you know, 
um, with community link workers. And that can be things like uh, just not having enough time. If you have someone with mental health issues, then uh, you know you need you need more time. You need more time following up information. You need tailored information, and you need to put in a bit more money into services. So, as well as you have the community linker, you need to feed that through to mental health services. Uh, unfortunately, you know when it comes to um, people with mental health issues from all ages, and we're talking from children to pension age, um, we, we see, you know, that, uh, the, you know, especially within it, when it comes to counselling, uh, a lot of the uh, counselling services are, uh, I'm talking about unpaid, fit into certain criteria. So, for example, if, uh, you know, um, if you take drugs, then you might get some free service. But what about someone with mental health services? There are limited services. I know uh, we at Support Mind Scotland, so we do have uh, our Stafford Centre and we do have counselling, but there's such a long waiting list. Uh, um, we need to sort of feed a little bit more money into these services to help uh, um, people with poor mental health. Uh. Thanks very much for that. And can we hear from Hannah as well, please? Thank you. Um, so, SAMH provides a link worker service in Aberdeen City, and in Aberdeen, it's one of the few places in Scotland where there's actually a uh, um, community link worker embedded in every single GP surgery there. Um, the link worker programme as a whole varies across health boards, so I can only really speak to our experience um, as a service provider of that. Um, but our, our link workers are regularly in contact with people who um, present with mental health problems. Um, and um, once you know they take the time to delve into those issues, find that they're actually being caused by um, financial difficulties or burdens as well there. Um, so in 2021, I think about um, half of the referrals made to that service um, included a mental health component, and a further third involved finances and benefits. Um, so our link workers really take time um, with an individual to identify their kind of personal goals and overcome barriers that are affecting their mental health such as um, financial issues. Um, and um, that's something that GPs quite often don't have the luxury of time to be able to do. So I think link workers will really be key um, in, in taking that time with people um, as more and more people kind of become affected by these issues during the cost of living crisis. Um, they then can support people to achieve these goals. Um, and that might be through supporting or referring them to housing or management services, benefit support services, um, and employment support as well. And it's fairly common for our link workers to find people um, are not in receipt of all of the benefits that they are actually entitled to. So that's going to be a really key um, role they play, play as well. In terms of um, the, the kind of picture across Scotland, as I said, it's really varied um, in health boards. There's not a standard community link worker role, and that can kind of that, that we believe is affecting consistency of delivery across Scotland. Um, in some health boards, I mean, there aren't any link workers currently um, in other health boards um, because of the kind of banding of the link worker role that the um, Health and Social Care Partnership has adopted for. They might not have you know, access to medical records and, and um, things like that. So um, I think that's something to um, be considered as well in the role of link workers. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, and I'll bring in and then Natalie Dawn with her question. Thank you. Thanks, convener, and thank you to the panel this morning. We, we touched on breathing space very briefly in some of the comments earlier, but I'm just looking to ask the panel if you have any other suggestions for reforms or improvements to the processes and procedures that could help people experiencing debt and mental health problems. Um, and I'll go to Rebecca for that first, please. Yeah, so um, in addition to some of the other stuff that I talked about, um, the debt and mental health evidence form is a really important mechanism by which people with mental health problems can hopefully, if it's accepted by their creditor, get better support from their creditor. And that can look like that can be, for example, um, creditors helping them with a better repayment plan, um, potentially cancelling interests or charges, or in some instances, even even writing off certain debts. So it's a really important tool, but there is a big barrier to it in that um, in Scotland still GPs are able to charge for that form to be completed. So in England and Wales, we campaigned for that charge to be stopped because prior to that, we were finding that up to, I think there was around one in three people with a mental health problem who were being charged for that. And that charge was up to about 150 pounds in some instance. So a really 
huge barrier. Um, so we would say it's completely unfair that that cost is having to be held by people with mental health problems and who are needing that support. So one thing that we would really be looking be extended to to um, to Scotland is is yeah the stopping of that charge. And I think just a couple of things which um, happen in England and Wales help sort of facilitate that change in that form. So so. In sh essentially, we that form was both shortened and simplified in an attempt to sort of reduce the burden on, on GPs and completing it. And I think, you know, we're, we're going to do some evaluation actually later on this year in terms of the new debt mental health evidence form that we have in England and Wales, because there's always room for improvement. But um, through simplifying and shortening it and stopping that charge, um, yeah, I think that's a really important way that people with mental health problems can get greater support from their creditors, hopefully, um, in managing some of their debts. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I understand that time is moving on, so if any of the other panel want to come in on that, otherwise I'll pass back to the convener. I don't have anything saying that anybody else wants to come in on that. Um, what I would say is, you know, we've come to the end of our time this morning and, and it was too short because I think that we could probably ask a lot more questions. And what I would like to say to all the panellists is if there's anything that you think that we need to hear or you want to underline, please send it to us um, in writing. That would be very helpful for us in terms of the questioning that we are having coming down the line next week with regards to, to council tax um, and insolvency, etc. Um, so it would be really interesting to hear that. And the information that we've got this morning round about the debt and mental health